Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My son Joshua is here with me today, as is my brother-in-law, Mike Hohn. And as Senator Thune said, my, my daughter is otherwise detained, and, and my husband is recovering from surgery in South Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, um, and Ranking recover. Member Reed and the members of this committee for so, for so graciously uh, welcoming me. Um, and thank you also to Senator Thune and Senator Rounds. People of South Dakota are known for being hardworking and humble and kind. And I think they are well led in both of you. Mr. Chairman, without objection, I'd, I'd like to put my whole statement in the record and then just uh, summarize for you. My nomination was unexpected, and I didn't anticipate returning to federal service. I really enjoy being a university president, being the president of the South Dakota School of Mines, and educating the next generation of young engineers and scientists, and making a contribution to the community in which I live. I live a blessed life. We all do. And we enjoy the blessings of our liberty because volunteers step forward to protect the rest of us. If confirmed, it would be my honor to lead and serve them. As senators in this committee, you know well that America's vital interests continue to be threatened, and I won't belabor the lists of threats that we face. But I think we sometimes take for granted American dominance in air and space power. The last time that an American ground troop was killed by enemy aircraft was April 15, 1953, during the Korean War. Two legs of the triad have deterred our enemies and helped to keep the peace for over 70 years. And for 26 straight years, the United States Air Force has been involved in combat, combat operations. But dominating the high ground is not a sure thing, and there's cause for concern. We have a mismatch between our strategic objectives and the military means we have available to deter and confront threats. The Air Force is too small for what the nation expects of it. Since the Budget Control Act of 2011, the number of airmen has declined, but the demand for air and space power has increased. Leaders of the United States Air Force have testified that less than 50% of the conventional Air Force is ready for all of the missions assigned to them, and I have no reason to doubt that estimate. We are short over 900 fighter pilots. 900 fighter pilots short of the missions that we need to fly and fight. The Air Force is not currently ready to fight against a near peer competitor, and that should concern all of us. And our equipment is aging in the Air Force. The average airplane today in the Air Force is 27 years old, and the next Secretary of the Air Force will modernize fighters, tankers, bombers, intelligence platforms, the nuclear deterrent, munitions, space capabilities. If confirmed, I will work with the Secretary of Defense and the United States Congress to restore the readiness of the force. I will also work with the Congress to address constraints imposed by the Budget Control Act so that the Air Force can be cost-effectively modernized. As a leader, I tend to be values-driven and mission-focused, but I'm also people-oriented. The quality of our leaders, particularly at the squadron level and the wing level, really sets the culture of the United States Air Force. I look forward to working with the Chief of Staff to bring renewed focus to training and educating airmen, particularly focused on the quality of command. While our airmen of today have to face the fight of today, this committee and the other defense committees in the Congress, and the Secretary in particular, really have to prepare for the future. I hope to review and further develop the research and development priorities for the Air Force to be able to look to the long term so that we're not only able to dominate today, we're able to face our adversaries for tomorrow. In sum, if confirmed, I intend to focus on readiness, modernization, the quality of command, and research and development for the future. On a personal note, several of you know that my roots in aviation are quite deep. 
My grandfather lied about his age and joined the Royal Flying Corps in the First World War, the predecessor to the RAF. He flew subsearch over the Irish Sea, and he helped to integrate propeller arcs with machine guns and synchronize them, which sounds like a good idea to me. After the war, there was no work in Scotland, so he came to America, and he was a barnstormer, and he opened little airports all around New England. And in the Second World War, he flew for his new country. He flew for the United States of America. My father started flying when he was 13 years old, and he enlisted in the Air Force after high school, and he became a, a mechanic and a crew chief. He was a crew chief on the hottest jet in America at the time, the F-84 Thunder Jet. And he was stationed at Walker Air Force Base in Roswell, New Mexico, and Otis Air Force Base in Massachusetts, and Selfridge Air Force Base in Michigan. When he got out of the Air Force, he went home. And in the 1950s, when a lot of women didn't even drive, he taught my mom how to fly. They rebuilt an airplane together. And then he was a commercial pilot and built experimental airplanes, including inside our 1,600-square-foot house. My mother was a very tolerant woman. We live in a remarkable country. And when I, at the age of 17, went into the United States Air Force Academy, I became the third generation in my family to serve. My husband is also a 30-year retired Air Force Guard and Reserve Judge Advocate General. We are served by innovators and intrepid airmen who take great risks on our behalf. <clears throat> I've been called back to service in a role that I did not seek and did not expect. If confirmed, I will do my best to do my duty. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.